Hello there folks, good evening. A uh, very, very warm welcome to you. Great to have you with us uh, tonight on Wednesday the 25th of November 2020 as we come together for our Wednesday worship. I'm just checking that the sound is coming through and I think it is. I seem to be very loud this evening. I'm going to try and um, adjust that a little bit. Hope that where you are the volume is about right. Uh, on Sunday morning I was coming through with picture and no sound and uh, while some people might have thought it was an improvement, overall the feedback was that you wanted to hear me. So here I am now in uh, glorious sound and in picture. So let's um, to give a warm welcome to all who are with us. David is here and you're most welcome. Good to see you. Uh, Thomas also is here and there's Isabel. Pearl, there's Richard in Duncan Ely. Uh, yes, indeed, yeah, bit damp maybe there tonight. Hello, Jean and Robbie. Hello there, Dorothy and David, Roland, Mandy, and Robert. Kathleen is here. Dorothy is here. So is Adrian, Kathleen, Deirdre, Doreen, Kathleen, and. Uh, Everybody and Kathleen is confirming that you can hear me. That's good. And there's Daphne and there's Muriel. Welcome all of you. And I'm so glad that you are here. I'm going to do what I always do and remind you that you can hit the like button and you can also share uh, to let people know and to attract people maybe onto this page and to watch so they can hear the word of God. Kathleen in England in Tewkesbury is hearing us as well. Great, wonderful, wonderful stuff. That is fantastic. Uh, we are, we're on track. It's eight o'clock, so I think we should get started. Let me give you an announcement or two briefly before we do get started kind of formally. Can I mention this to you, uh, what's up here on the screen, which is the uh, Bible in one year. And uh, just to show it's a real thing, there we are. So this is a uh, book, it's a, a version of the, the, it's the Bible, it's a new international version of the Bible, but it's been divided up into 365 daily readings so that you can use it um, from January the 1st to December the 31st and read the whole of the scriptures in a nice modern English version. Now, I got a bunch of these and I've sold them all, but I'm hoping to get some more. So if you'd like to get one of those, then please, in the next couple of days, send a message to our page. That one is just seven euros and 50. Um, we also have this one here, which is um, a sort of a more hardback, sort of a, almost like a, I don't know what you call it, like a leather effect almost, a sort of a hard back. It's red and um, it is a slightly bigger format. The writing is the same, but it's got a wide margin and you can put your own thoughts and jottings. So we'd love to encourage people to read the Bible in the year 2021. Okay, let's put that away. What else is happening? Well, uh, it's the 25th of November, so in a month's time, it'll be Christmas Day. Uh, we know that. Um, we don't know very much else about what might be happening then, because we just don't know how the coronavirus situation is going to go, but uh, we are led to believe that there will be an announcement by the end of this week, maybe on Thursday or Friday, of what way the exiting of the current restrictions might happen. So I'm hopeful, but far from certain, that we may be able to um, return to having services gathered together in church, which we now haven't had since the end of September, about nine weeks ago. And so let's really pray for that um, and let's uh, hope that we're able to, to come together. It may be for the whole of December. It may be only for a couple of weeks around Christmas, 
but let's wait and see. So um, I'm working on a plan to have um, services in church at Christmas, all being well, um, as well as still doing some stuff online also. So all the details will be revealed as soon as we know what we are actually able to do. Okay, um, meanwhile, of course, we carry on online. So this coming Sunday, which is the 29th of November, the first Sunday of Advent. So we will be beginning to look ahead um, to Christmas and also thinking about uh, the Lord's return. And that's Advent Sunday coming up uh, 11 o'clock on the 29th. Okay, just to remind you also that um, to watch out for your parish update, which will come to you on Thursday or Friday, um, your weekly update. And there will hopefully be some information in that about um, a new uh, s- some schemes to help uh, families that are in need, which you may like to contribute towards. Uh, or indeed, you may know someone that would benefit from um, so we're really, really keen this Christmas time that as far as possible, nobody is left um, stuck for finance or for food or for friendship. OK, so that's the three things we want to make sure that everyone has enough finances, enough food and enough uh, friendship. OK, so we're going to work to do our little bit on that as much as we can. And that's for everybody to be part of. Uh, And if you are in need of some help, then please just get in touch. Okay, before we get started with our first hymn, we welcome Isabel, Ron and Myrtle, the old folks at home. Ah, my dear mother and father, not so old at all, uh, in great form and up there in Lisburn. Good to have you with us. Julie and Joel are with us. So is Joy. So is Louise, Vivian and Milton. Uh, Gillian is with us and Albert perhaps as well. Uh, Thomas is here in Dublin and Rebecca is with us. Irene and Mary and I'm sure a load of other people that are watching in. Okay, before I lose uh, track of where we are, let's have a hymn. On Sunday, I had a couple of hymns lined up for my final hymn, and I went for There is a Redeemer. And you were wondering, what was the other hymn that I didn't choose? And it was this one. It was uh, Alleluia, Sing to Jesus. The words will appear in the comments if you're watching on Facebook. Sing to Jesus, his the scepter, his the throne. Alleluia, his the triumph, his the victory alone. Hark the songs of holy Zion, thunder like a mighty flood. Jesus, out of every nation, has redeemed us by his blood. Alleluia, not as orphans are we left in sorrow now. Alleluia, he is near us, faith believes nor questions are. Though the cloud from sight received him when the forty days were o'er, shall our hearts forget his promise? I am with you evermore. Alleluia, bread of heaven, on earth our food our stay alleluia here the sinful 
will flee to thee from day to day. Intercessor, friend of sinners, earth's redeemer, plead for me. Where the songs of all the sinless sweep across the crystal sea. Savior, who has gained the victory. Glory to the Holy Spirit, fount of love and sanctity. Alleluia, alleluia, to the triune majesty. And let's just continue for a moment together and a very simple song as we think of that majesty of Jesus Christ. We've sung to him there as our king, as the uh, uh, the unfailing Lord of our lives. And now a very simple few words. Let's pray to him now, Heavenly Father and our Lord Jesus Christ and the glorious Holy Spirit. We praise you, our triune, majestic God. We come before you and we thank you. We thank you that in spite of all the frustrations, all the difficulties, all the trials and all the problems that we face, that Lord, you are good. You are worthy. You are holy. You are gracious. You are kind. We pray now that by the help of your Holy Spirit, we may come before you in worship, praise, thanksgiving, learning from your word, being uh, encouraged by your truth, being strengthened and equipped to serve you, to love you, to walk with you this day and always. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good evening. If you've joined us in the last few minutes, it's great to have you here. Please feel free, if you're watching live, um, to send in a comment on the Facebook um, page there. At the bottom of your screen, there's probably a place where you can put comments. And it's a great way 
that we can make up for the fact that we're not seeing each other face to face, but we can at least talk to each other in that way. So please don't be shy about saying hello and sending in a little comment uh, as we go. What we're going to do now is to uh, come before God in confession, acknowledging our sins, acknowledging our failures. I don't know about you, but I'm very, very aware of how often I slip up and how many times uh, I get things wrong. And it's very tempting to want to justify ourselves. And it's actually right that instead of doing that, that we come and we humbly say to God, I have got it wrong again. Forgive me and help me to walk in a new way going forward. So if you're aware of things which uh, are not right in your own life, then let's join together in these words of confession. Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, and through our own deliberate fault, by what we have done and by what we have failed to do. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, we really give thanks to God for all his goodness and for that wonderful forgiveness which he offers to us. And we're going to turn now to the Word of God. I'm going to bring you the reading, which comes tonight from Acts chapter 14, and beginning at verse 21. Acts 14, from verse 21 to 28. All the multiples of seven there for the mathematicians. Acts 14, 21 to 28. Talking, remember, about uh, Paul and Barnabas on their missionary journey. They preached the gospel in that city, the city of Derbe, and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. After going through Pisidia, they came into Pamphylia. And when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Atalia. From Italia, they sailed back to Antioch, where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed there a long time with the disciples. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord, we now pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, our eyes may be opened, that we may behold wonderful things in your word, and that our hearts may be strengthened, as these believers long ago found, in order that we would remain true to the faith to the end of our days. In Jesus' name, Amen. Ah, do you know what we're doing here uh, this evening and on these Wednesday evenings is so strange, isn't it? Do you not think? I mean, here we are reading uh, a book about the travels of a couple of religious teachers 
who lived 2,000 years ago and who did their traveling and their teaching 2,000 miles away from where I'm sitting, more than 2,000 miles from here in Donegal. How very odd. Why would that be relevant or interesting? It seems something that would be of no importance except to some really strange kind of nerd who was just happened to be fascinated by the history of uh, travel and religious teaching in the first century AD. But of course, there's something unique and wonderful about this book, The Acts of the Apostles, which sets it apart from all other travel uh, journals, from all other accounts of religious teaching. And that is that this faith that has been taught by these teachers at this time is the same faith which we hold to today. The same teachings which inspire our lives now, whether we're in Donegal or in England or in the USA or in Indonesia or wherever we are that you're joining us from tonight or even County Tyrone. Wherever you are joining us from, we're really, really uh, glad to have the opportunity to delve into this book, The Acts of the Apostles, because we believe that this is our faith and that what happened 2000 years ago is essentially the same things that will happen today in the church if we follow Christ in the same way that they did. So let's let's get stuck in and let's see what's going on in tonight's passage. Well, um, let's look at it this way. Do you remember when Paul was converted. That was back in Acts chapter 9. Remember the road to Damascus? He was um, traveling to go and see if he could persecute some more Christians and uh, put them out of the synagogues and throw them in jail. But then the Lord Jesus uh, appeared to him and struck him blind, threw him down off his horse and said to him, Saul, I'm changing your life from this moment on. And do you remember how the word came uh, to Saul, which said um, that he was going to preach the gospel to the Gentiles and that he was going to suffer for Jesus' name. So the two things that were promised, you're going to preach to the Gentiles, the non-Jews, and you're going to suffer for my name. And what you find is that... um, Those two things come abundantly true. They come abundantly true in what follows. More and more. In fact, on this first missionary journey that we read about in Acts chapter 13 and 14, it actually happens increasingly. Increasingly, Paul preaches to the Gentiles. So when he's in Cyprus, he seems to be mainly speaking to the, the Jews. And then when he gets into uh, Pisidian Antioch, he's, he's still mainly speaking to them. But some Gentiles start to believe as well. And then uh, by the time he gets to Iconium and Lystra, it's, it's mainly the Gentiles that he's speaking to. And here in Derby that we just read about, he finds a large number of Gentiles coming to faith. So he's increasingly speaking to the Gentiles. But also the other side of the coin, he's increasingly uh, facing suffering and persecution. So in Cyprus, at the early part of the journey, that persecution, is that suffering or difficulty is only really uh, having this kind of nutcase, um, Elimas, who's opposing him and trying to stop people believing. Then they get to Pisidian Antioch and there's a more concerted attempt to speak badly against Paul and Barnabas. On to uh, Lystra, uh, they end up um, having rocks thrown at them and being left for dead, in Paul's case anyway. So there's increasing suffering as well as increasing success in the mission. Well, let's look more closely at this last part of the journey. Just divided into four little sections, nice and short. First of all, we see them, we see bouncing back. I'm going to call this bouncing back. Because remember that Paul was left for dead in Lystra. But before long, he's disciple making in Derby. 
left for dead in Lystra. And next thing, he's disciple making in Derby. He bounces back. He travels 35 miles from the city where he was stoned to the one where he next preaches. Must have been a tough journey. Imagine the uh, injuries that he must have had. But he bounces back. Inspired and empowered by the Holy Spirit, he carries on preaching. There's tremendous inspiration here. And in fact, it turns out to be that it wasn't for nothing. It wasn't for nothing that he preached in Lystra. Uh, because although it's not mentioned here, it turns out actually there were plenty of converts there. And one of them was one of the most significant uh, leaders in the early church after Paul. And that was Timothy. We'll meet him again in chapter 16. But it turns out that Timothy... One of the great leaders was from the city of Lystra. So the very place where Paul had rocks thrown at him, he also found one of his most significant um, helpers came from there. And then, of course, we find a large number of disciples. Here they go into the city of Derby. Um, not Derby, that's in the north of England, but Derby. And uh, they won a large number of disciples. So the lesson here is very simply is never despair. Don't give up. Whatever the setbacks, and most of us in our Christian life and journey and in our Christian ministry that we may be involved in, uh, we won't suffer setbacks as big as having rocks hurled at us to the point that people assume we're dead. You may have some unpleasant comments thrown at you on social media. You may have some misunderstanding uh, between you and other people. You may have family uh, not taking kindly to your faith. But in most cases, it's not going to go further than that for us at this stage. But of course, in many parts of the world, and some of you who are listening know this, that there's a real cost to being a follower of Jesus and that it has actually led you to real suffering and hardship and yet don't despair don't give up because as we see here um, they bounce back the setbacks the stumbling blocks turn out to be stepping stones for the work of the gospel you see that for example in the way the good news spread in china in the 20th century so a huge setback when all the missionaries were thrown out of that country but it turned out that the church grew more and more through the hardship of the communist years. Could it be, I'm sure it is true, that uh, the COVID situation and coronavirus that we're going through at the minute is going to prove to be a springboard for great things that the Lord is going to do if we will trust him. So that's the first thing, bouncing back. Second thing we see is we see them retracing steps, retracing steps. Now, here's a wee bit of geography and a slightly different map this time. OK. Oh, not that map. Sorry. Um, this map. Just move over so you can see this map right here. Now, uh, what you see is the uh, the red line is the journey. So starting from Antioch in Syria, they set out, they go to Cyprus that great island, and then they come across to the shores of uh, Asia Minor, and they go up to the other Antioch, and then across to Iconium, down to Lystra, and across to Derbe. So you see there, around about the middle of the picture is the city of Derbe, where we are now. And you can see that the quickest way to get back to where they started will be to keep going east, to keep traveling from left to right on your picture and to go down through Tarsus, which was Saul's uh, or Paul's hometown, and then on to Antioch, to the yellow dot there where they began, or the orange dot. But instead, they go back. They retrace their steps. And, well, we know that they're uh, guided by the Holy Spirit. But also the reason that they're doing that is they want to go back to the places they've been. They want to strengthen the new disciples. They have a real concern for those people who have come to newfound faith in Jesus Christ. And they want to build them up and not leave them lacking. 
So they retraced their steps. Let me put that away now so you can see me instead. They retraced their steps. Uh, it's so, so important, isn't it, that new Christians get the teaching and the follow-up that they need. Maybe some of you are relatively new to Christian faith. Perhaps I know that there are people um, connected with our church and with our wider ministry who have come to faith in the last couple of months. And you're very new to following Jesus. Uh, and that is wonderful. And you need help and teaching. And it's wonderful that you're here tonight. And I hope you'll make use of the other opportunities that are there in our various different online groups. Look on our Facebook page for all the details. Um, and also, um, you who may have been Christians for years, you need strengthening and teaching as well. So Paul and Marmus retrace their steps so they can give good grounding in the faith. And then thirdly, uh, we see this. We see two things. How do they strengthen them in the faith? Encouragement and elders. Okay, let's look at those things. First of all, encouragement. So the apostles give the people good teaching. It says they encouraged them to remain true to the faith. So it's very interesting that Paul and Barnabas don't seem to give these Christians whole piles of extra teaching. But they seem to remind them of what they already knew. That's a very, very common New Testament principle that what we need is always to be reminded of the gospel, of the basics Always be wary if somebody comes to you and says, there's this wonderful new idea that nobody's really discovered before or heard about, but I'm going to tell you about it. Um, that's a warning bell. We probably should give much more time and credence to someone who says, look, you know this already. This is your this is Bible basics. I'm just taking you back to the fact, you know, Jesus uh, God loves you. Jesus died for you. He rose from the dead. He sent the Holy Spirit. He wants you to live a holy life and he's coming one day in judgment and salvation. Those were the things that Paul and Barnabas were emphasizing again and again, reminding them of the gospel. And what you find in the New Testament is that very often the apostles are having to undo the damage done by people who are coming in and either adding something to the gospel or taking something out of it. So they're either coming in and saying, well, you know, you also need to have some great special new experience or some uh, fantastic new piece of knowledge that you didn't have before, or people who are saying, no, no, we're going to take something out of the gospel. No, we're going to take out repentance or holiness or something like that. Okay, point made. Um, so they're saying to them, stick with the plan, stick with the gospel, stick with what we taught you, and don't move from that. Stand firm in the faith. Second, they encourage them by being really realistic about the difficulties that they're going to face. They say, um, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Or I think I would translate that a wee slight bit differently. I would say, um, it, it is necessary to enter the kingdom through many trials. Um, so it's the thing that's necessary is to enter the kingdom of God. And the thing that's inevitable is that there will be trials and difficulties and problems along the way. It would be wonderful if I could sit here tonight and tell you that if you would simply just pray a prayer and give your life to the Lord Jesus, then it would be the end of your problems and difficulties. Uh, but it's not the case. It's not the case. I can promise you that if you give your life to the Lord Jesus and follow him, that your difficulties will be in a different perspective. And that your difficulties will one day come to a happy conclusion when you meet the Lord and go to be with him forever. But I can't promise you that there'll be no difficulties because uh, both the Lord himself and his apostles promise the opposite. That the Christian life is a life with trials and temptations and troubles. But those are a pathway 
that we tread following the Lord Jesus and one day they will come to an end. And in the meantime, those trials strengthen us. So that, there's great realism here. Uh, so whatever trials you are facing, I don't mean trials like going to court because you've done something bad. Okay, we're not particularly encouraged in that direction. Um, what I mean is suffering that comes because of your faith, because of your genuine attempt to live in love and faithfulness to Jesus and you come into difficulty because of it. Um, keep going, stand firm and continue to show love and forgiveness even to those who are hating you. He gives them encouragement. And then the second little part of this, uh, what does he do to strengthen their faith? He gives them elders. He appoints leaders in the church. Very interesting. It says, Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. So there's leadership here. And this word elders um, is presbyteroi, it's, that's the Greek word um, from which we get words like Presbyterian, okay, um, the, like that particular branch of the church. And also we get the word presbyter, which is a word for an elder, which has come down into the English language, uh, sometimes changed to priest. Um, and sometimes uh, the Christian leader is called a priest, which really comes from being a presbyter, uh, being an elder in the biblical sense. And so these are not priests like in the Old Testament offering sacrifices in a temple, but they're pastors and teachers. They're shepherds of the flock and preachers of the word of God. And they administer the baptism and the Lord's Supper, the sacraments. So interesting what you see here about church leadership. You see a leadership that's local. Paul and Barnabas appoint people from the local area. It's quite interesting, isn't it? Makes you think, doesn't it, about people like me who are parachuted in from somewhere else. And there's good reasons for that as well. But interesting. Um, you see a leadership that's multiple. There's elders. Uh, we're not exactly sure how did that work. You know, was every congregation, did it have multiple elders? Or was there an elder in each small house-based church? And then perhaps a, a, a sort of chairman of the elders, what we would call the bishop, over them. Um, the way in uh, the Presbyterian church it works is that each congregation has multiple elders. Uh, the way it works in the Church of Ireland is that each congregation or parish has one elder. Uh, and then the uh, across the diocese, there's a group of elders. Like in Rafo Diocese, we have about 16 um, serving presbyters, uh, ordained ministers, and retired ones as well, and people serving in a variety of other ministries, like lay readers and so on. So there's multiple leadership. Uh, and you also find, of course, here in Acts 14, that the training seems to have been on the job. They didn't get sent off to a, a Bible college for three years. Uh, I'm very thankful for having had that privilege and training. But these ones were trained on the job. And that's important too. I wonder, is there anybody here watching this evening on whom the Lord might be placing a call in your life to be to the ministry of an elder in the church, to that presbyter? pastor and teacher ministry to be the shepherd of a congregation of the church of christ i can tell you that it's a wonderful wonderful calling and if the lord is speaking to you in that direction then you need to speak back to him and to someone else that can advise and guide you okay so we've seen the apostles bouncing back retracing their steps giving encouragement and eldership. And then finally we see mention here of a door of faith. They return back to Antioch to where they begun 
Uh, they miss out Cyprus this time for some reason. Um, I think there's actually quite a few Christians there already, as is hinted at in uh, Acts 11. Um, so they skip out Cyprus and they head back to Antioch in Syria. And they report the great news. Uh, it says that they shared the good news, not of what they did, the news of all that God had done through them. How wonderful it is to give testimony to what God has done. I hope that we will have more and more opportunities to share what God has done in our lives individually and through us. And I think that's something that we must not neglect. The, the good Sharing the good report of what has been done through us by God. And what they report is that God has opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. A door of faith has been opened. What a wonderful image. And let's finish with that thought. That there is a door that's open. That anybody, whatever your background, whatever your past, whatever your present circumstances, a door which you can walk through and come to Jesus. I hope that that is a door that you have entered and it's a door that you're pointing other people to. God has opened a door of faith for everybody who is willing and ready to walk through it and to come to him. What a wonderful truth. So let's keep going in the truth of God. Amen. Well, we've just got a short time. The, the time is flying on this evening. You've been very patient with a lengthy message. And I'm sorry, I know it's, uh, it feels even longer when you're watching online. So well done. You're sticking with it. Full marks to you. Let's take a moment to pray and then we'll have one final song. Let's pray. God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you that in just a few short verses of Acts 14, there is so much there. We thank you, Father, for the pastoral care of Paul and Barnabas. We pray that we'd learn from that, that we would seek out good teaching for the strengthening of our faith. We thank you for the encouragement and perseverance of Paul and Barnabas, that they didn't give up despite setbacks. We pray that at this time, when we're faced with so much difficulty through the pandemic, that you would give us the confidence that you have your good plans in all of this. We thank you for the encouraging teaching that Paul and Barnabas gave to the new Christians. And we pray, Lord, that we would also be ready to lap up the truth of your scripture, your word. We thank you for the realism about difficulties. And Lord, we pray tonight for any and all who are going through times of testing and whose faith is being severely challenged by tough circumstances. O oh Lord, come to them by your Holy Spirit. Strengthen and establish their soul in Christ and enable them to know that these trials and sufferings are part of the pathway to the kingdom. We thank you, Father, for our leaders, for our elders, for bishops, priests and deacons in your church, for those in our own um, congregations here. We thank you, Father, for Nula, our diocesan lay reader. We thank you for Sandra, our parish outreach worker. We thank you for Louise, our administrator. We thank you for our church wardens, for our select vestries, for those who help in our worship and those who represent us on synods and boards and committees and many, many others in various forms of ministry. We thank you and we ask you, Lord, to make these forms of service a joy and a blessing. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Take just a moment of quiet for your own prayers.
Pray for those who are sick, for those who are lonely, for those who need practical help and support, for those who are lost. Amen. And the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. Well, I was thinking about how the uh, Paul and Barnabas reported. It says, uh, what God, uh, what does it say again? All that God had done through them. All that God had done through them. And this uh, final song is very much on that theme. If I can get the pages uh, in front of me. Uh, let's find the words also. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing. All is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark, but I am forsaken for by my side the Savior he will stay I labor on in weakness and rejoicing for in my need his power is displayed to this I hold my shepherd will defend me through the deepest valley he will lead not I, but through Christ in me. No fate I dread, no fate I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid, for Jesus bled suffered for my pardon, and he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hope my sin has been defeated. Jesus now and ever is my plea. Oh, the chains are released. I can sing, I am free, yet not I, but through Christ in me. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus, for he has said that he will bring me home. Day by day, I know He will renew me, until I stand with joy 
before the throne. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. All the glory evermore to Him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, Yet not I, but through Christ in me. To this I hope, my hope is only Jesus. All the glory evermore to Him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, Yet not I, but through Christ in me. We thank you that it is not uh, anything we do in our own power that matters, not our great schemes or plans or notions, Lord, but it is what you do through us. So, Lord, may we be open. May we be open to be used by you. In Jesus' name. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. 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 Well, before I bid you good night, just um, remind you to please uh, join us on any of our other online services and activities, and please listen out carefully for announcements of what we are able to do uh, around Christmas time. And please feel free as well, as I said at the beginning, to like and to share any and all of the stuff that we are putting out. I'll leave you with a um, reminder of the various events um, coming up. And uh, good night. God bless you. And we'll talk again soon.